Hey, I'm Andy. If you don't know me, it's probably because I'm not famous. But I did start a men's grooming company called Harry's. The idea for Harry's came out of a frustrating experience I had buying razor blades. Most brands were overpriced, overdesigned, and out of touch. At Harry's, our approach is simple. Here's our secret. We make sharp, durable blades and sell them at honest prices for as low as $2 each. We care about quality so much that we do some crazy things, like buy a world-class German blade factory. Obsessing over every detail means we're confident in offering a 100% quality guarantee. Millions of guys have already made the switch to Harry's, so thank you if you're one of them. And if you're not, we hope you give us a try with this special offer. Get a Harry starter set with a five-blade razor, weighted handle, shave gel, and a travel cover, all for just three bucks plus free shipping. Just go to harrys.com and enter code FACE at checkout. That's harrys.com, code FACE. Enjoy! A science story, huh? These NYU scientists, they I felt, felt, felt I right. Really right. I was so and I just thought, well, I had figured it out. It was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. This week's story is from Anika Risi. The story was recorded in January 2013 at Union Hall in Brooklyn. The theme of the event was Behind the Scenes. I came here tonight to make a confession. I'm not proud of what I'm about to tell you, and really, after all these years, it would be easier to just let the lie stand and allow the world to continue believing what it so clearly wants to accept as true, but I can't do that. When I consider Lance Armstrong, <laughs> and when I look at my nieces and the babies of my friends, and I think about the kind of world that I want them to grow up in, I know that I have to come clean and set the record straight. So here it is. The major scientific discovery reported in my fourth grade science project. Those breakthrough findings were completely fabricated. <laughs> it was a fake. Everything that you have believed for the past 24 years about what causes hair to tangle <laughs> is based on a lie. A lie that I conjured out of thin air and rendered in colored pencil. I'm sorry, but I can explain. Like probably most scientists and most liars and fakes, I was motivated by the desire to impress girls. <laughs> I wanted to be popular. Um, popularity was a major concern for me in third and fourth grade because I didn't have a lot of it. And um, it wasn't that hard to make friends with boys, but finding and keeping female friends was much, much trickier. And the popular girls in particular just seemed to understand something fundamental about what it is to be a girl that completely eluded me. And I wanted in on those girly secrets. And I tried. I tried making friends with girls. Um, in second grade, I tried joining the Brownie Scouts, but my application got rejected. And so... I tried forming a club of my own, the Friends Club, in third grade. Um, I was the only member of the Friends Club. And um, I even tried booby trapping our entire classroom for April Fool's Day 1987 to show how fun I could be. But it turns out that running trip wires between all the desks and putting thumbtacks on the chairs is only fun for the person planting them, <laughs> and that it tends to inspire more animosity than admiration or camaraderie from one's peers. So I needed a new plan. Um, I take full responsibility for my actions, of course, though you really could blame the Brownie Scouts. Um, or, and as a children's book editor, it pains me to say this, but you could blame books. See, in third grade, I read this story, a scholastic paperback, about a kid who does a science fair project on plants and chlorophyll, and he somehow becomes photosynthetic himself in the process, and he turns his teacher into a plant and saves the day and becomes very, very popular. And I read this, and I thought, I can do that. 
my big takeaway from the novel was that choosing the right science fair topic could be the key to popularity. It still seems like a strong hypothesis. <laughs> I want you to know that I tried the path of legitimate science first. So that year, third grade science fair, for my topic, I chose blood. And I chose blood as my topic because I thought blood was cool, and I thought it was cool that blood does not make me squeamish. So I worked really hard, and I did a lot of research um, about hemoglobin and platelets and coagulation and all kinds of hardcore legitimate science stuff that probably even my teachers didn't know about. And I went to the medical center where my dad worked, and I took pH levels of blood samples. And for the display that would lure all my new friends to the booth, um, I ran vials of blood through the centrifuge, which separates them out into red and white blood cells. Blood cells. Um, which is awesome. And <laughs> on science fair day, I stood proudly next to those blood vials as all of my classmates gathered to admire the baking soda volcano that Molly Ricker had made, <laughs> as if it weren't exactly the same as the other 34 baking soda volcanoes in the room, um, all of which had apparently been thrown together the night before. And I noticed this, and I understood the flaw in my approach. I understood that popular girls do not think blood is cool. <laughs> popular girls are naturally and adorably squeamish, like Meg Ryan. And if they're not, they fake it. And furthermore, popular girls don't care about blood because blood is on the inside. And popular <laughs> girls care about appearances. <laughs> so I realized this, and the next year, I was ready. And when it came time to choose my topic for the fourth grade science fair, I selected something that was designed to appeal to those girls I wanted to impress. And I did my fourth grade science fair project on hair. And I worked really hard at it. But I did not make any of the previous year's mistake of including any academic thought. <laughs> this project was largely visual. Um, I made a huge display. And on one side of the display, there was an in-depth scientific examination of different hairstyles you can have. <laughs> um, I cut photographs out of well-respected journals, such as Teen and YM <laughs> and Newsweek and Consumer Reports. And I put those photos on the display and I labeled them, you know, ponytail, French braids, beachy waves. And on the other side of the display, I had cut um, ovals in the cardboard. And my classmates could come, and they could put their faces in those <laughs> ovals. And they could look in the hand mirror that I held up, and they could see the answer to pressing scientific concerns, such as, what would I look like as a blonde? <laughs> and how would I look with curly hair? Um, keep in mind, this was before Photoshop. There were computers in the world, but they could only be used to play Oregon Trail. <laughs> So it was the day before the science fair, and my father looked at my project, and he declared it completely unacceptable because it contained no actual science. Um, he probably wanted me to research cells and keratins and pigments, but you know what? That stuff is for dorks, and dorks are not popular. But if I wanted to be allowed to leave the house, I had to incorporate some science. And as every kid knows, there are three easy ways to make something scientific, right? One, you can put it in a test tube or a beaker and add some form of acid. <laughs> Two, you can look at it under a microscope. Or three, you can add scientific labels. Um, so I said, fine, you want it to be scientific? I will look at it under a microscope. And we went back to the medical center, and I made some slides, and I looked at hair under a microscope, and I drew little diagrams of what I saw, which look a lot like the diagrams on the back of the Pantene Pro-V shampoo bottles. Um, and as I was drawing these diagrams, my heart just sank, because I knew that my father was right. This project was lame and it contained no actual science. And my inner difficult to suppress nerd um, was deeply, deeply embarrassed. So that's when it happened. In order to make the project um, more legitimate and more scientific, um, I faked the major scientific discovery of what causes hair to tangle. I took those diagrams of what hair actually looks like under a microscope and I added tiny, never-seen-before hooks <laughs> all along the strands of hair. 
and I wrote a report revealing my breakthrough findings. <laughs> and then I typed the report, because looks do matter. <laughs> now, science fair projects at my school underwent a rigorous review process that involved the teacher walking by and glancing at the project for a few seconds <laughs> and flipping through maybe half the report and then assigning a grade based on the grade that you always get. Um, <laughs> But my project came under a little extra scrutiny that year, as any major scientific breakthrough should. <laughs> and the teacher paused, and she looked at my diagrams, and she looked at me, and she said, really? I've never noticed tiny little hooks all along the strands of hair before. To which I shot back, well, have you ever looked at hair under an incredibly powerful microscope? <laughs> And she had to admit that she had not. I got an A. And that A kept me company as all of my classmates and potential friends gathered around Molly Ricker's booth to admire her baking soda volcano. As if it were not exactly the same as all the other baking soda volcanoes in the room and exactly the same as the baking soda volcano she had made the last year. So in the end, the science fair did not make me more popular. And I never got let in on those girly secrets I was after. And the secret of what truly causes hair to tangle, um, that great mystery of the universe, remains unsolved. <laughs> but I do now get paid to make shit up. <laughs> Most of which I don't have to apologize for. <laughs> That was Anika Risi. Anika is an executive editor at a very fancy publishing house in New York City, and she always, always flosses. She likes oceans, ginger, and winning. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have our magazine, archives of the podcast, and upcoming events. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, and Ari Daniel Shapiro. The podcast is produced by Rose Avalith. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, Josh McCall, and Raffaella Benin. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Union Hall for hosting the show and to my school for not having a science fair. Actually, on second thought, I'm not terribly thankful for that. Wait, why didn't they have one? Anyway, thank you for listening. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation? where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission. At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders. From ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities, CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.